to me, active management takes place on multiple levels in mm-hmm. terms of security selection, fund selection, factor tilting, portfolio construction. It's complicated. It's a skill. It's difficult. So if we start actually from the lens of EQ or emotional intelligence, and we're actually listening to what the clients are telling us, well, then we can set a vision for a portfolio that is built to maximize the probability that it's going to fund contentment. Welcome to the Active Advisor Podcast, brought to you by Harbor Capital. Join us as we learn from pros who have helped thousands of investors live better lives. I'm Brian Moore, and I'll be chatting with some of the brightest minds in the financial advisory business, bringing you insights on practice management and investment research that works for advisors and their clients. Welcome to the Active Advisor Podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Brian Portnoy, CFA, a renowned expert in the psychology of money, Brian is not only the founder of Shaping Wealth, which is a premier learning and development platform powering human-first financial guidance. He's also a best-selling author with books published in nine languages. With a rich background spanning nearly two decades in both hedge funds and mutual funds, Brian has worn many hats as an investor, researcher, and educator. He's also a proud CFA charter holder and holds a doctorate from the prestigious University of Chicago. Can't wait to tap into some meaningful insights from a financial thought leader of his caliber. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. I've got to ask nine languages. Do you actually speak all of them? That's the best first question. The answer is absolutely not. I don't speak Portuguese. I don't speak Spanish. Come to think of it, I only speak English. So eight of them are out of my depth. It's just the publisher has translators. There you go. Well, I mean, if we're being completely transparent, my uh, professors in college, my high school, the English teachers would say that I have trouble with English myself. So either way, it's very impressive. I struggle as well. I'm still working on my main language. Yep. Every day is a learning experience. No doubt. So we traditionally start here with by kicking things off with the question, what's your first memory that you have related to money or investing? Yeah, so the money and investing question, they're two different memories. The first money memory is actually a really bad one. My first memories of money are really of my parents fighting about money. I mean, they really got into it. It was, they ultimately got divorced, which is a good thing. They seem to really dislike each other. And the number one topic of disagreement was who was spending what on what. And it was miserable to be around. My first investing memory, fast forward from the 70s to the 90s, was that in the mid to late 90s, I bought my first stocks. And you remember, I'm sure many listeners remember the go-go tech market of the 90s. And everything went up. And I was like, well, this is relatively easy until most of those stocks went to zero. So my first investing memory was basically, this is harder than it looks. Well, hopefully you learned that lesson sooner than later. I learned it right away. I'm a pretty quick study on some things. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. So one, we've heard about your first memory. Let's fast forward to today. Can you tell us about your journey and how you were led to the intersection of finance and behavioral economics? Sure. So I've been working now for close to 30 years. I'm Becoming an old man, Brian. And of course, through multiple careers, not just jobs, but careers, starting in politics, moving to academia and leaving academia for investing in finance, started my career at Morningstar, which Chicago-based investment research firm. At the time, it was 300 people. Now it's like, what, 7,000 people. But cut my teeth analyzing mutual funds, interviewing fund managers. It was great. I loved it. So I spent what ended up being not just at Morningstar, but with a bunch of firms in both the mutual fund and hedge fund industries, an investment researcher, ultimately a portfolio manager, overseeing relatively large pools of capital, billions of dollars. And there came a point, I'd say around 2011 or 2012, when it just sort of dawned on me, it became apparent that the psychological dimension to investing was really all that mattered. I had spent more than a decade witnessing thousands of fund managers not being able to beat their benchmark and asking, well, why is that? How do PMs do better? How do investors do better? And like a bolt from the blue, Kahneman, Tversky, Thaler, social psychologists like Sheena Iyengar, a book called How to The Art of Choosing, just began to really dive into the psychological dimensions of how we make decisions, both good and bad. And the finance piece and the psychology piece came together and 
I kind of liked it so much, I just began to write in the space myself. And three books later, and a behavioral consultancy called Shaping Wealth, my career has really pivoted sharply from investment management to the wealth management industry. We work with thousands of advisors all over the world on better decision-making, habits, well-being. And I just see that confluence happening globally. No, that's excellent insight. And doing just kind of readings to your website and some of your material that you published, in the book, Geometry of Wealth, you discuss the difference between being rich and being wealthy. Could you elaborate on this concept? Is there an example you can share? Yeah, sure. So it's page one of the geometry of wealth. The fork in the road, and I think it's a material one, is between rich and wealthy, where rich is the quest for more for deep psychological reasons, for deep evolutionary reasons. The quest for more is both satisfying, but also ultimately very dissatisfying. So rich is having half a million dollars and wanting a million, having a million and then wanting two million, two million to four million, and so on. As Don Draper said in Mad Men, happiness is that feeling right before you want more happiness. That's the quest for more. And more is a number. And the quest for more, the quest to be rich, there's nothing wrong with it, but we need to understand the deep emotional limitations of becoming rich, of achieving more. Contrast that with wealthy. So in The Geometry of Wealth, I coined this term funded contentment, which is my tagline for true wealth. Funded contentment is the ability to underwrite a life that is meaningful to you and however you choose to define that. So while more is a number, wealth is more of a story. The search for having enough in life, that is a story. And if we can calibrate the, how we define a contented, purposeful life with our balance sheets and our checking accounts, then we can achieve this funded contentment. So my view to tie a bow around it, is that there's nothing wrong with wanting to be rich, but where we should spend most of our time in life is that search for true wealth or funded contentment. Understood. So if I may kind of paraphrase, and would love to hear your feedback. Rich is, is a great goal to have, but you're really, the overarching goal is to kind of achieve wealth, which is that complacency is not the right word, but kind of that satisfaction that you've gotten to where you want to be. Yeah, I would actually, I would jettison the word complacency. That's the opposite of what I'm advocating. I'm saying that the search, the quest to be rich is actually pretty miserable. We work in the financial services industry. People make good livings. Lots of people have lots of money. That has relatively little to no correlation with whether or not they're leading a, a contented, happy life. Ultimately, I'd like to think that's what most of us want. No one has their balance sheet on their headstone right? They're probably, they want their epitaph to be something more meaningful. So when we think about the joy that we want to experience on a day-to-day -day basis and money's relationship to that search for daily and broader joy, that is time well spent. Um, trying to turn $2 million into $2.5 million, like, well, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not where I think most people want to spend their time that's not to say that the wealth management industry doesn't drive people toward that because the wealth management industry is focused on numbers. The wealth management industry is focused on the way humans are not wired, which is why so many people have such poor experiences. I'm trying to pivot that conversation, pivot the industry toward a focus on what really matters. And how do you work with advisors and how do you, have you seen, I guess, successful advisors do this, relay that to their clients? Yeah, in some ways, what we're trying to do at Shaping Wealth is drive better conversations between advisors and clients on the things that really matter. And if you look at where the industry's been, it was a brokerage business, buying and selling of, of securities, and that evolved into an investing and allocating business. Hey, I want to pick the best funds and build the right portfolios. But if that's your sole focus, you're not having a particularly deep or, or meaningful relationship with the client. Where we see the industry now is that it is very much focused on planning. We might take for granted that financial planning is a thing. 25, 30 years ago, it wasn't. There were some financial planners out there. Now it's a big global growth industry. The way that we work, so Shaping Wealth is a learning and development platform. We offer coaching courses, content, community to advisors. We've got clients on six continents. And our clients are working with us in order to become better financial guides. 
we make a big distinction in our work between mechanics versus guides. The industry is in a place where we're helping people move along life's journey. And you want to build the right vehicle, but then make sure it's go heading in the right direction. So building the right vehicle, the engineering or mechanical problems of choosing the right investments, building the right portfolios, purchasing the right insurance, making sure that your estates and your taxes are optimized for a whole variety of different factors. Well, that's non-negotiable in its importance, and those are skills. But then there's another piece to the, okay, well, I have a plan in place, but am I actually going in the right direction? That guidance element has been taken for granted. The psychology of financial planning has been taken for granted. If you ask an advisor, hey, have you ever felt like your client's therapist or psychologist? 100% of them will say yes, 100%. I've asked rooms filled with five, 700 people. Every single hand goes up. Well, being that you're not trained as a psychologist, you're not trained as a therapist, but you are engaging in those emotionally charged conversations, we as an industry aren't really trained in that. So it's just not being a people person. It's certainly not just being a good salesperson. It's looking at established disciplines like behavioral finance, positive psychology, neuroscience, emotional intelligence, and recognizing that there are skills that fall out of these disciplines that can be learned at scale by firms who really want to deliver what is now the leading edge wealth management experience, which is that deeper engagement. So it sounds to me like you're really helping advisors foster kind of a new growth or an evolution, actually, could probably better be a better way of saying it. Within the concept of evolution is the concept of adaptation. All the time, we say to our clients, we say to prospects, how are you adapting? How do you think others are trying to adapt? Because going back to Darwin, Origin of the Species, 1859, it's not the swiftest or the smartest who survive, it's those who are most adaptable. And the question is, how are you going to adapt? And we work with one person RIAs, we work with firms that have more than 10,000 advisors on their platform. The same questions land, which is, how are you going to adapt to all of the changes that are happening? The question, Brian, is never, are things going to change? The question is, well, what's going to change and how am I going to respond? And we're choosing to help out in a slice of that. Again, we're not training mechanics. I know something about investing in portfolios, but that's a previous career. We're not helping you pick better investments or choose the right insurance portfolio. We're saying, hey, there's a whole series of guidance issues that you can and should be familiar with. And the way, especially in light of generational change, mm -hmm. boomer to Gen X to millennial to Gen Z and, and coming up Gen Alpha, these questions that involve emotional intelligence, these questions that center around well-being broadly, as opposed to outperforming your benchmark, it's only been like 25 years since we've gone from, am I beating my benchmark to, am I leading a meaningful life? But that is what's happening. Well, are you any good at that? How do you know? And if you are good at that, from a coaching perspective, how do you stay good? Tom Brady, LeBron James, the best of the best, they have teams of coaches. Not because they stink, but precisely the opposite, but because they're the best and they want to be the best and stay that way. So you've mentioned this concept of integrated wealth coaches that's going to be kind of what we see the advisor community having to migrate to in the next 10 years, or a bowl, actually is a better word. Can yeah. you speak about that transition and the underlying need of what is driving this shift? We have, and you know, Brian, you got me on the word driver. It's complicated. The world's a mess. So if you think about what's going on, it's impacting us professionally, certainly impacting us personally as individuals, as partners, as parents, as children, many things. One, we've never had more information, more choice, more data than ever to deal with. And frankly, we're overwhelmed. It's not clear that the brain is wired to deal with as much information as we're being asked to process. Two, we just had a biblical plague wipe its way through the planet Earth. A lot of people passed. A lot of people were traumatized. And the world changed in so many ways, in no small part, like think of the workplace, working from home, reevaluating careers, things like that. From a generational point of view, as I alluded to, an increasing focus on well-being. So all of these things are taking place in the context of the old stodgy financial advice business, where it was historically about just, hey, I'm going to build you a good portfolio so we could beat the market, or we can achieve your retirement goals. I think increasingly individuals, couples, and families from every generation, they're asking for something more. You referred to this, quote, integrated life coach. There was a study from McKinsey within the last 
two or three years where they basically said, hey, within the next decade, this is where the industry is going. And by integrated life coach or wealth coach, it's going beyond the portfolio, beyond the insurance and having conversations about the two questions that I think matter. I think there's really only two conversations that anybody wants to have. Two questions. One, am I going to be okay? And two, how much is enough? Almost every conversation between advisor and client does boil down at some in some way to those, and it maps to our evolutionary chain or dynamic of survive and thrive. We have to survive every day. We don't have to thrive every day, but we want to. And so the first question, am I going to be okay? Well, even if you're not in physical danger, we feel psychologically challenged every day in one way or another. And so survival is and safety is always an issue. And then beyond that, you want to flourish, you want to thrive, you want to live a good life, you want to do great things, you want to have fun, you want to contribute, you want to do so many different things. Advisors increasingly are involved in those sorts of conversations with their clients, and it's heavy duty. I think it's pretty awesome to see it taking place, and it's a generational shift. I mean, this isn't something that takes place in a year or five. There's an old line that I love that's a little bit morbid but true, which is that progress happens one funeral at a time. The old is going to go away, and we're going to be left with a fresh new industry over the next half to full generation that's going to look very different than the one that exists now. I couldn't agree more. And I definitely think, just kind of in my own research and and having worked in multiple facets to this business, you see five years ago, 10 years ago, some of the corner office advisors, so should I say, were really thinking about servicing the family. They were maybe just thinking about servicing the main breadwinner. And you've definitely started to see a shift of kind of, okay, wait a minute, there's different dynamics playing out here. And the generational shift that's happening and the way society's morphing, I need to actually start treating everybody else in that family additionally as well. And I think just in talking through in this podcast to different advisors, you see different people doing that in different ways. Where do you see advisors excelling, doing things differently? And where do you see them struggling? We're kind of sitting right in the heart of this global discussion of so-called human-first financial guidance, where we're working not just with clients who say, hey, I want to retire at 65 with 3 million bucks. They're having a real-time conversation about the life they want to live now and later. So you switch from client-centric to human-centric advice. I would say that there's a number of leading-edge firms across the world, US, Canada, Australia, UK, you name it that have equipped their individual advisors, but their overall teams to provide that experience. And it's involved because if you look at the real leading edge, you're seeing advice firms that are acknowledging that one, our clients want to flourish generally. They just don't want financial well-being. They want holistic well-being. Well, that involves physical well-being, emotional well-being, And, you know, providing services that from a physical health point of view can point you in the right direction because our most precious asset is time. And if you're not healthy and you die prematurely, you can't use any of this money that you've worked so hard to earn and invest and so so forth. So there are some leading edge firms that are really embracing the holistic piece to it. Most firms aren't there yet. Many firms won't even go there. So the firms that seem to be thriving from our lens are the ones that are Having investing in having these better conversations, equipping their teams to do so. The ones that are struggling, and by struggle, I don't mean financially. They could be doing just fine, but I spoke to a firm the other day, a very old school broker dealer. They thought I was just sort of full of it. And that's fine. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with having boundaries to the client segments that you serve. They want to sell product. They want commissions on those products. And then they want to go golfing. And they don't want to hear my stuff on well-being and funded contentment. And so I'm not saying they're behind. They're just different. And it's okay because there's a huge market out there with hundreds of millions of potential customers. And there's going to be different solutions for different sorts of clients. I do think, though, that when you take an old school brokerage and you take their clients and you say, hey, did you know that? an experience like this is available elsewhere, they'll often say, no, I had no idea. That's actually what I want to be engaged with. So when I say this is a generational shift, it's going to take years for some of this messaging to come out because generally speaking, the financial advice industry does a lousy job telling people what it does. I know thousands of advisors, 99 point something percent of them care deeply about the families that they take care of. 
and they're doing really good work. And that's known within the relationship and maybe within some of those communities. But more broadly speaking, individual firms in the industry generally are lousy at talking about the virtuous work that this industry is engaged in. So we've talked about what advisors are struggling with and what some are doing differently. What are some of the ways that shaping wealth is helping advisors and their clients achieve this ultimate goal of financial peace of mind? Yeah, so as a headline, we offer content, coaching, courses, and community to the advice world. And we've observed just in our day-to-day that advisors are busy, overwhelmed with things, pulled in so many different directions. Even firms that are doing well financially, there's budgetary constraints. So the way that I've built my business with my team is to offer just a variety of programs and other experiences that range from, I'll just say, cheap and easy to more immersive coaching. So shapingwealth.com does a, I think, very effective job at clearly setting out kind of what we do and for whom. And one end of the spectrum, we have an always-on dashboard that we call the Outsource Chief Behavioral Officer, OCBO. And actually, the wirehouses, some other very large firms, they have a chief behavioral officer in-house. They have expertise in psychology and other disciplines, and they're producing some content and some good stuff. Almost no, very, very, very few firms are going to have their own CBO. They've never even heard of the concept. At the same time, almost all firms would love to see there being better decisions, stronger habits, higher well-beings, not only on behalf of the clients, but also on behalf of the advisor. So I aim to be the world's, my company to be the world's chief behavioral officer for the wealth industry. We want to be the go-to resource for decisions, habits, and well-being. So we've got a subscription platform called OCBO. We've got an immersive coaching program called Building the Behavioral Advisor. We've got a very light coaching program called the Foundations of Behavioral Advice, which is not only for advisors, but also for any employee of a wealth management firm. We're really helping firms build stronger human-centric wealth cultures because this, this is relatively new. And when you're dealing with something new, you need the vocabulary, you need the framework. So we're delivering that in a multimedia a style experience, multi-sensory, and firms love that. And other workshops and programs along the way. So that. I've seen the demand since I got into this segment of the industry almost a decade ago, launched the firm a few years ago in order to meet what I see as a need. And thankfully, we're growing relatively quickly. That's awesome. Let me ask you one final question before we get to closing. What would be one piece of advice I guess you could give to advisors right now who presently are not working with you? Work with us or not, I would encourage any advisor listening to think about emotional intelligence as a skill. Just like your vertical leap or chess, you might not be Michael Jordan, you might not be Gary Kasparov, but you can be slightly better at these sorts of things. Our IQ is sort of fixed, leave it at that. Our EQ is not. And so when you think about the different dimensions of emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, and relationship skills, these are all things that in one way or another you can invest in so that you can show, not only show up better for your clients, but serve yourself better. Engage in more self-awareness training. Understand that where you're coming from. We've seen this over hundreds of different clients. When an advisor engages in more self-awareness, knowing what their money story is, really come to terms with like, why are you even, why are you an advisor to begin with? How did you end up here? What are the types of clients you like working with versus not? Dozens of questions that you can use to explore that then has an amazing halo effect for the client engagement. So one thing I'd say is, and Shaping Wealth is by no means the only purveyor of emotional intelligence training. We just happen to cater to the wealth industry. So we're quite knowledgeable about the specific issues that help that occur at advice firms. So yeah, one thing is think of EQ or EI as a skill that you can be better at. And if you think of the ultimate wise sages of this space, Oprah or Brene Brown, who are the highest EQs in the world. They're just so wise and have so much perspective. The goal is not to be them. The goal is to be a slightly better version of yourself. I can guarantee you, Brian, people will notice if you're doing that work and it's going to have amazing benefits. That's awesome. And that's very sound advice for anybody who's listening, whether you're an advisor or not. We at Harbor believe wholeheartedly in active management. But every financial professional has their own take. In all of your research and experience with advisors, 
Where do you see active management having the biggest impact? So to me, active management takes place on multiple levels in Mm -hmm. terms of security selection, fund selection, factor tilting, portfolio construction. It's complicated. It's a skill. It's difficult. So if we start actually from the lens of EQ or emotional intelligence, and we're actually listening to what the clients are telling us, well, then we can set a vision for a portfolio that is built to maximize the probability that it's going to fund contentment. So our core idea, remember, funded contentment, the ability to underwrite a life that's meaningful to you. Let's focus on the word underwrite. Okay. So how can you actively invest in order to underwrite a life that's meaningful to you? Well, you're choosing an asset allocation mix that is appropriate. You are choosing individual pieces within that allocation that fit. And maybe at times you want to own a particular market segment, so-called beta. And at other times, in one way or another, you want to tap into factors. And I used to do a lot of work on factor investing and whether it's value or momentum or quality, or mean reversion, or all of the different things, whatever tools you have in your toolkit, never lose your North Star for why you're doing all of that. So absolutely essential. Just make sure it's tied to why you're doing it in the first place. And I say that because there's, I wouldn't say there's a dark side to it, but there's a side to it, Brian, where because this stuff, which I devoted 15 years of my life to, is so intellectually fascinating. And I wrote a whole book, my first book called The Investor's Paradox is partly about this and how I picked my eyes up after 15 years and saw kind of a bigger picture. It's very easy to get lost in the weeds of active management because it's so intellectually stimulating. It's so potentially interesting that you can lose the forest for the trees. So I'd encourage anyone engaged in active management to kind of keep the eye on the prize. That's excellent advice. Excellent advice. How can people find you? What's your social, your website? Yeah, shapingwealth.com. Real easy. I'm BP at Shaping Wealth. You can reach out to me anytime. And then I'm pretty active on Twitter at Brian Portnoy. I'm going to stick with Twitter. And as strange as it sounds, the last six, seven years, probably a career highlight has been the community that I've been fortunate to meet through Twitter, the so-called financial Twitter or FinTwit community. Thousands of people writing about investing Mm -hmm. advice, planning, you name it. Uh, I'm active in those dialogues, good people talking about important things. So yes, shapingwealth.com and at Brian Portnoy. FinTwit, it's a very resourceful, very thought-provoking and interesting universe for those, whether you're in the financial community or you just want to learn a little bit more about it and hear a bunch of different kind of opinions and kind of open your eyes. And you can hear me complain about my Pittsburgh Steelers daily, (laughs) daily. (laughs) I annoy myself, Brian. So yeah, daily. If you want to hear me chirping about the Steelers, join on in. There you go. And you can turn in for Steelers info. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Now we're fortunately going to turn to my favorite part of the podcast, which is the, I like to call the lightning round. Or it's officially called 60 Seconds with Brian Portnoy. Let me know when you're ready. Go for it. Nickname. Portnoy or BP. Hobby. Dungeons and Dragons. Most used emoji in texting. I've been leaning heavy into the wink emoji lately. Alternate universe profession. Travel agent. If you could teleport anywhere for just five minutes, where would you go? I would go to a rice terrace in Bali. If you could meet any historical figure, who would it be? Martin Luther. What's the best professional advice you've ever received? It's a quote from Joseph Campbell. Follow your bliss. Favorite useless fact. For a year, I was the research assistant for Madeline Albright. They were ice cream flavor. Pistachio. Who do you consider your biggest mentor? The blessing of the friends that I have who have supported me. Most adventurous thing you've ever done. I traveled Europe by myself for three months when I was 21 years old. You hit the snooze on the alarm clock. I'm old enough that I no longer use an alarm clock. Ebook or physical book? Ebook for fiction, physical book for nonfiction. Favorite way to get active? I run a lot and I love to play tennis. Whether you're a seasoned advisor or just getting started, the Active Advisor brought to you by Harbor Capital offers professional insights for the financial advisor community. Visit us at harborcapital.com to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe to the Active Advisor on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date on investment trends, tried and tested research methods, and what your industry peers are up to. From all of us at Harbor Capital, thanks for tuning in. And now, for important disclosures, this material is for informational purposes and is not intended to be relied upon as a forecast, research or investment advice and is not a recommendation, offer 
or solicitation to buy or sell any securities or adopt any investment strategy. The opinions expressed are as of 5th of October 2023 and are subject to change. The opinions expressed by the speakers do not necessarily represent the views of Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. The information and opinions contained in this material are derived from proprietary and non-proprietary sources deemed by Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. to be reliable and are not necessarily all-inclusive and are not guaranteed as to accuracy. This material may contain forward-looking information that is not purely historical in nature. Such information may include, among other things, projections and forecasts. There is no guarantee that any of these views will come to pass. This material may not be representative of the experience of other individuals. Reliance upon information in this material is at the sole discretion of the viewer. This material is not legal, tax or accounting advice. Please consult with a qualified professional for this type of advice. Investing involves risk including the risk of loss. Stock markets are volatile and equity values can decline significantly in response to adverse issuer, political, regulatory, market and economic conditions. Fixed income investments are affected by interest rate changes and the creditworthiness of issuers. As interest rates rise, the values of fixed income securities are likely to decrease. Specific companies and issuers are mentioned for educational purposes only and should not be deemed a recommendation to buy or sell any securities. Any companies mentioned do not necessarily represent current or future holdings of any investment products. Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. does and may seek to do business with companies covered in this podcast. As a result, listeners should be aware that the firm may have a conflict of interest that could affect the objectivity of this podcast. This material is prepared by Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. is not affiliated with Shaping Wealth. All trademarks or product names mentioned herein are the property of their respective owners. Copyright 2023 Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. All rights reserved.